First Timothy chapter 6. Therefore I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you. Oh, I'm in the wrong place myself. Sorry about that. I was like, wait a minute, that don't make sense. That's not what I studied. All right. <laughs> now godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. May God bless the reading of his word and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for today. Pray, dear God, that your word will flow in and through me, Lord, uh, that you will hide my sinful self, Lord, behind the cross, Lord, that there's nothing that I can say that can encourage, Lord. I, I need encouragement myself. But I know that through me as an instrument, Lord, that you can speak through me and give encouragement to each and every person out there today. So I just pray to God that we will take hold of that word and that we'll take it and apply it to our lives today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Inside of each of us is a God-shaped hole. You ever heard that phrase? There's a song about it I'll play in a minute, so I'll let you listen to it. But inside of us is a God-shaped hole. It means that there's a place inside of us that only God can feel. And here's the problem. A lot of times we fill ourselves with so many things, and God has that for us for a purpose. Now, it's not a new idea. In 398 A.D., St. Augustine of Hippo wrote in his confessions, he said, You have made made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Now, you might not have caught it the first time. This is worth repeating. Listen to this again. He says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. So what is that telling you? It's telling you that, hey, look here, there's something about us that gets restless inside. And when we get restless inside, we go and seek other things to fulfill that. So there's something that's missing in our hearts today, and we try to fill it with other things of the earth. So it's an easy job for Satan to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to tempt them in this way. I'm going to tempt them in that way. And, and it's easy for us to go into that and fill ourselves with the wrong things. You know what the Bible says in Genesis? He said, let us create man in our image. Okay, the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. He's saying, let us create man. Let us create man in our image. What does that mean? It means that we're supposed to have fellowship with God. It means that we're made for an intimate relationship with God and Him only. You remember when they were uh, in the Garden of Eden? You remember they loved to meet with God in the cool of the day. And all of a sudden they walk through the garden and there's God's presence was with them. Can you imagine that? That's an, uh, an amazing thought, amazing picture that as they were walking in the cool of the garden, the nice part of the day when it's cooler, and all of a sudden they're walking through the garden and there's God's mist among them. You see what happened? And you remember what happened is that when Satan tempted Eve and then Eve showed it to Adam, and they both ate of the fruit. What happened with them? As they were walking in the cool of the day, you remember that? And then God says, hey, where are you? Now what happened now was that they hid because of what? The sin that was in their lives. Now it wasn't the, it, it, that's not where the hole's at. It's not because of sin, it's because our relationship with God. But what sin does is it affects our relationship with God. And we fill it with so many things instead of filling it with God. God said, I created you in my image so that you could fill everything with you with me. Nothing else. But what happens in the world today? We fill it with so many things. Aaron, you're going to have to plug your ears because I've got to talk about your man in a minute. So I'm sorry again. All right. Just, uh, just, you know. All right. So I want you to think about people like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is, uh, is a man that's got what? What does he have plenty of? He's got plenty of money. Matter of fact, if Donald Trump wants something, all he has to do is ask for it. All he has to do is send somebody out to get it for him. Let's suppose that you're sitting there. You ever, you ever get that craving for something? I know you women get it, especially when you're pregnant. But don't you just get that craving sometimes to where, man, I wish I had this. Remember that? You know, you've, you've been there. 
What if you had somebody that just says, hey, go get that from the store. I'd like to have that. That's what Donald Trump had. Everything that you could possibly want out of his life, he had. But you know what? There's something missing out of Donald Trump's life. Do I believe that he's a Christian? Not by the way that he showed it, no. Uh, but I can't say that. He may have a relationship with Christ, but he doesn't demonstrate it. Let's just put it that way. But one thing that I can tell you is that there's something missing in his heart. There's a God-shaped hole in his heart. And you know what I believe? This is a personal opinion, by the way, so don't, don't email me with hate messages. This is a, just a personal opinion. But I believe that God, I believe that here's what happened. Donald Trump had all, everything that you could possibly want. You know what I think he did? I think he got bored. Oh, this is boring. I got everything you could possibly want. So what could I do now? Well, maybe I'll just run for the president, you know, and be, have that power now also. You see what I'm saying? Now I can be internationally known. I'm already known by most people. But now everybody in the world will know me. Now I've got that power. You see what I'm saying? You know why? Because he's seeking something. And you know what's going to happen after the presidency is over? And if, and if he don't get the presidency... You know, guess what's going to happen? He's going to be empty again. Let's suppose that he does, uh, for some chance, get to be the president of the United States. Let's suppose that he gets reelected after four years and he spends eight years in the White House. You know what's going to happen after eight years? He's going to be empty again. You know why? Because he's trying to fill himself with something that he's not supposed to fill himself with. It's not, it's something that's supposed to be there. God had that hole in your heart for a reason so that you can fill it with him. You know, Bruce Jenner. Bruce Jenner was one of those guys that when you were in, uh, uh, now, it was probably way before my time. I ain't quite that old. But uh, probably in the 70s, uh, wasn't it in the 70s when old Bruce Jenner was up in his, uh, you know, he was, a, he was a sports phenomenon. I mean, where, where was the one place that you would see his picture? Where? Wheaties boxes. You would see his pictures on Wheaties boxes. He was the man's man. He was the one that, hey, look, I got all this stuff. You know, he won all the things that he set out to win in sports. And then he had all the money that he could accumulate, that he could possibly think that he had. Everything in the world that he had. And now he figures that there's something missing. So he takes that and it's something that's missing and he tries to uh, you know, of course, you know what he done. And I'm not here to poke fun of it. I'm just telling you that he's got something missing in his heart. And, and, and hey, listen, let's just don't make fun of Bruce Jenner. Let's just don't make fun of Donald Trump. Let's know that a lot of us do it. A lot of us look for something that's not in our lives and we try to fill it with something and it just becomes crazy. And then when that something don't come and turn out to what, it, uh, what you think it's going to be, what happens? Loneliness sets in. We start getting down. We start getting to where we're a little depressed. Because you know why? Because we search for something we shouldn't have searched for and it fell apart. What God is saying, I want you to fill yourselves with me. Why is that so hard? Does anybody, anybody else, hey, I am a preacher. I find it hard to do that all the time. That's a confession you probably won't get from many preachers. I'm just going to tell you, it's hard to fill yourself with God all the time. You know, it means that you've got to constantly just want God and feel it and fill yourself with God and want more of him. Well, sometimes, I, you know, I get lazy just like you do. Sometimes I get tired. Sometimes I stray off the path. You know why? Because that's what old Satan's wooing us to do. If we can just get you off that track, if we can get you off that path, guess what? You're going to try to fill yourself. It's an easy job for Satan. All he's got to do is just say, hey, look here, why don't you try this now instead? If there's anybody in here that can say, is there anybody in here that can say that I have not been wooed by Satan before? That you had said, hey, you know what? Satan's never wooed me. You know what I'd call you? I'd call you a complete liar. I wouldn't do that in church, and I wouldn't do it if you raised your hand. I would have changed that subject up. <laughs> I would have changed that statement. But I'm telling you, you would be a liar if you said that Satan has never wooed you. He woos you because he knows that there's a hole in your heart that's only supposed to be filled by God and Satan will throw all kind of things at you. Hey, if you'll just fill it with this, it'll be okay. There's a song by Plum. It's called God-Shaped Hole. There's a God-Shaped Hole in all of us. And I said, you know, why don't we just play the video and let the words be shown so that you can see it. Let's see if we can see it.
she say in that song that there's a God-shaped hole in all of us and he says that they go, the soul keeps on searching and it's searching for something and what is it doing it's wanting to find something it's wanting to find God and that's what it's there for us all right so when we think about this I, I brought up the scripture because I want you to see this there's things that we need to fill our lives with number one we need to fill our lives with enrichment now think about this to make the definition of enrichment is to make someone rich or richer, to improve the quality of something, to make something better. What does serving God make us do? It makes us better. Do you know why that there are people that have taken over? There are 12 tables, 11, 12 tables back there today. That when we get out of church, they're going to be doing a lot of cooking. They're going to be doing a lot of prepping. They're going to be doing a lot of putting the tables out. Why? Why would somebody just go and do that? Well, let me tell you something. It makes you feel good. It makes you feel stronger. It makes you feel like, hey, I'm having a purpose in my life. And the problem is, is that when we get out of church, it doesn't enrich our lives. It does just the opposite. And what we need to be is enriched. And when we fill ourselves with God and doing the things of God, we're enriched. Hey, I feel like the richest person on this earth. I really do. I feel like, number one, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. That, there's nothing richer than that. All right, number two, I believe that is because of both of the jobs I do, that I'm the uh, drug and alcohol director at the, sub, uh, at the Salvation Army, and I'm also the pastor of this church. There's two things that I'm able to do for God, and I'm able to serve Him all day long. And you say, well, that's because you're in ministry. Let me tell you something. Even if you're not in some type of full-time ministry, you're in ministry. So when you're going out there and you're going and doing the things of God, you need to be excited where you work at. You need to be excited, set an example for those because it enriches your life. It makes you feel better. What can I say? It makes you feel better when you live for God. When you see people that are serving at this church, it's because it makes them feel better. It makes you feel better because there's a purpose that you're feeling, feeling in your life. You know how many people out there that don't know what their purpose is in life? Do you really want to know? Do you really want to know how many people are out here in this country right now that does not know their purpose in life? Well, you know what? There are you that are sitting here right now. You know your purpose. You should know your purpose. Our purpose is to live for God. And let me tell you something. There's nothing richer than there's not enough money that Donald Trump can have that can place that. He can replace what we've got. We're rich. We know what our purpose is. And let me tell you something. When somebody don't know their purpose, they search all their life. And you know what it is? There's an emptiness there. And it's a sad person when you see that they have not filled that, that void with something. We're supposed to fill that with God. It's an enrichment that, that, that takes us. It makes us better people. Why do I do what I do? It makes me a better person. Uh, there's a famous word that I use in this church, and I call myself this. And anybody know what it's called? What do I, what do I call myself? There y'all go, calling me a scumbag again. I'm a scumbag. I believe that. I believe that I'm a scumbag without the blood of Jesus Christ. He comes in and he changes my life and he makes me want to be something better than who I am. You know what? He makes me better. That's why I want God. That's why I want to seek after God because he makes me a better person. He enriches my life like nothing else in this world has before. Have you ever searched for things out there outside of God? How many of you just went out there and just thought that? How many of you thought that alcohol would be that? Don't raise a hand. Don't raise your hand, please. <laughs> I mean, you thought that alcohol or drugs or something else that would be just better and better and better. I'm going to keep it PG because I see some kids in there. But you know the things that you continually 
struggle with, that you continue to put other things in your life. So it's enrichment. The second thing we need to fill our lives up with is contentment. Contentment. Let, let me read verses 6 through 8 again because I want to make sure we get this. Now, godliness with contentment is, uh, contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these shall we be content. Let me tell you something. What is contentment? A state of happiness is satisfied. I'm satisfied. Can you say that? Say it with me. I'm satisfied. You know what that makes you feel like? I'm satisfied. You know what happens when you're going to eat my good old Japanese cooking tonight? You're going to say, I'm satisfied. Or sick one, whichever one comes first. I'm satisfied. I'm satisfied. Can you really say I'm satisfied? That's the best feeling in the world to know that I'm satisfied. That means that I don't have to have anything more. Whatever you've given me, God, that's enough. I'm satisfied. Can we say that? Do we have to continually to keep up with the Joneses? Tara and John, no, <laughs> we don't want to keep up with, just kidding. We don't want to have to keep up with those. We don't want to have to keep up with trying to buy more bigger properties and, and bigger houses and better cars and all this. We don't have to do that because we're content in what we have. That's what it says. Guess what he said? The things, uh, we brought nothing into this world. Nothing. You didn't bring a stitch of clothing in this world. You come out buck naked. All right? I'm telling you, you didn't have nothing on when you come out. If you did, you was a weird baby. <laughs> what happened, though, when you did come out, you were clothed. You were fed. You, all these things. Listen, you brought nothing into this world. There's nothing that you can bring into this world. And guess what? When you leave, you ain't carrying nothing out of this world. Amen. You see, you brought nothing in. And you ain't carrying nothing out. So all these things that, that people like Donald Trump, they keep searching for and they want to keep getting these riches. He's saying it's not going to lead to contentment. It's not going to lead to that. When we have contentment in our lives, it means I'm satisfied. I don't have to have anything. I'm good with what I got. Philip Parham tells the story of a rich industrialist who was disturbed to find a fisherman sitting lazily beside his boat. Why aren't you out there fishing, he asked. Because I've caught enough fish for today, said the fisherman. Why don't you catch more fish than you need, the rich man asked. What would I do with them? You could earn more money, came the impatient reply, and buy a better boat so that you can go deeper and catch more fish. You could purchase nylon nets, catch even more fish, make more money. Soon you'd have a fleet of boats and be rich like me. The fisherman asked, then what would I do? You could sit down and enjoy life, said the industrialist. What do you think I'm doing now? The fisherman replied as he looked over out among the sea. Now, I want you to think about that. Is that not a true story? Is that not a story that we have in our lives? Guess what? Continually seeking something. Continually. Got to have more. Got to have more. That's what our world teaches us. In the United States, and the richest country in the world is what we do. I got to have more. I want more. You know what it is? It's the world that our country has taught us nothing but greediness. Greediness. We're one of the greediest countries, the richest countries in the world, but we're one of the greediest. Greedy people. All we care about is making sure that we got plenty of stuff for ourselves. Let's just make sure that we accumulate stuff and accumulate stuff and accumulate stuff. It's pretty pathetic when we get to that point. It's pretty pathetic when we as a country have gotten to that point of where it's all about us. And it's not about anybody else. Listen, when we go on this mission trip in a couple of weeks, we're going to serve people there. We're not going to one of the richest neighborhoods in the world. We're going to one of the poorest communities in the world. And you know what? When those kids come to see us, whoever's over children's camp will be there, they will come to see us. And you know what they're looking for? They're just looking to be loved on. They're just looking to be loved on. When you go out and you do whoever's going to go out and do home improvement and you're going to maybe build a porch for somebody or you're going to repair a roof or you're able to do whatever it is that you're called to do, you know what? You're doing it for them. And you know what? And they're going to appreciate it. Out of the love that we have, this is why we do what we do. You know what? Yeah, we got everything we need. Is there a person in here that says, you know what? Uh, let me ask this question. If you're in the United States today 
and I believe this with all my heart, especially in Savannah, Georgia. I've told you this before. When somebody says, I'm hungry in Savannah, Georgia, and they're holding up a sign that says, I'm hungry, I need food, they're lying. Do you hear me? I'm telling you right now, they're lying. Because I know plenty of places that feed during the day at, in Savannah. Do you hear me? So I'm telling you right now that we have, every one of us has food here in the United States. If you don't have food, you could go back, you can go to any trash can behind any restaurant and find tons of food if you were that hungry. Right? Number two, thank God y'all got on clothes today. Okay? You ain't naked, you got on clothes. You got clothes, and guess what? If there's somebody around running around streaking, saying, I ain't got no clothes, they lying. They got clothes, don't they? Why? Because there's plenty of places that offers free clothing. Okay? Shelter? There's somebody without shelter? It's their own fault. Can I tell you that? Because there's plenty of shelters in Savannah that will house you. I know that because I work at one of them. When you say that I have food, you got me. You all said it. Y'all didn't all, didn't nobody argue with me. You got food. You got shelter. You got clothing. You got everything you need. If you got everything you need, that's where contentment comes in. I'm content with what I got because I got everything that I need. So things we need to avoid, uh, to avoid is entrapment. The definition of entrapment is the act of catching something or someone in a trap. Trying yourself. Let me tell you something. You remember what I talked about? That, hey, we can fill ourselves with these other things. We try to fill ourselves with other things other than God. What happens? You know what? When we start to do it, it's okay. You're going to slip up. You're going to mess up. You start to do it. But you know what? Satan don't want you just to do it. He wants to trap you with it. He wants to put you in prison. He wants to put a shackle around your leg. He wants to pin you down and say, hey, I got you now. I got you now. Where you going, big boy? You know why? Because, hey, the biggest, strongest man. I mean, you can take the biggest, strongest man and you can put cocaine in his life and it'll bring him to his knees. And it'll trap him and it'll take him and it'll grab him in a prison that he can't get out of by himself. No matter how strong he is. You hear me? That there are traps for every one of us. Your trap might not be cocaine. Your trap might not be alcohol. Your trap can be something else. But you know what it is, and guess what? Not only do you know what it is, Satan knows what it is. And he wants to trap you with it every time. If he can trap you, he's going to get you. And that's what he wants. He wants to get a hold of you so bad. Why does he want to get a hold of you so bad? Let's say, for me, I'm a child of God. Why would, why would Satan want to get a hold of me so bad? Because I'm a child of God. You know why? Because I'm a child of God. He hates God. If he hates God, he's coming after his people. You know why? Because he can't defeat God. So next thing, the next best thing is he's going to take his people out. And he's going to try to take us out. And you know what? If he takes me and knocks me down, guess what happens? The gospel is not going to be preached from me. You got what I'm saying? The gospel is not going to be preached from you. There's an entrapment that goes on there. All right, the second thing that we need to avoid is this, entitlement. Boy, the belief that one is inherently deserving of privileges or special treatment. Now, let me tell you something. I know because of the work I do, there are plenty of people that feel that they're entitled. Boy, one of the worst things that somebody can do is walk up and need help from us at the Salvation Army. And they need help. It's fine when you need help. You know when somebody needs help. And you know that they're humble about it. But it's them ones that say, what's wrong? I want it now. You deserve to give that to me. I need it. I want it. You know what, though? Before we knock everybody like that, I want us to take a deep look within ourselves. I want it. It's something that I don't have. I want it. I'm entitled to it. Do we in America feel entitled? You better believe it. We feel like we have to have it. We deserve it. We deserve it. We deserve these things. Entitlement is one of the worst things that can happen in a life. 
is to sit there and say, I deserve it. Guess what? If you have food, clothing, shelter, guess what? You did not even deserve that. I only heard one say, that's right, the rest of y'all didn't agree with it. Well, let me break it down for you. You don't deserve anything you get. That sounded harsh, Larry? Must have did. Listen. (laughs) Here's the thing about it. You know why we don't deserve anything? It's because God is a perfect God. And he gave us instructions in his book. He said, don't do this. And how many times when he says, don't do this, we do that. And when we do that, that he told us not to do, what happens? We don't deserve a a single thing from him. We don't deserve anything. But you know what? Let me tell you all. You wonder why God says, I always hear this, and sometimes it just aggravates me because people think of God this way. If God was such a good God, why would he allow all this stuff to happen? If God is such a good God, he gives you food and shelter and clothing. I don't deserve it. I don't deserve what I'm wearing. I don't deserve it at all. You know what I deserve? Let me tell you. I'm fixing to tell you what your pastor deserves. Your pastor deserves death and hell forever and eternity. Do you hear me? Oh, y'all didn't like that one. Let me tell you something. I'm telling you right now, I deserve Death and hell forever. You know why? Because I disobeyed God. Now check this out. God is such a loving God that he says, hey, I know you mess up. I know you mess up, but here's my grace. I'm going to send my son Jesus so he could die on the cross for you. So that you can have that grace and be forgiven of those things in your life. Isn't that amazing? You're going to tell me that. How can a loving God do that? You better be glad that loving God don't annihilate all of us. But he gives us a chance. And not only does he give. This is, this, is, this is going to blow your mind. Not only does he give you a chance to come to know his son Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. So that you can be in heaven for eternity. This will blow your mind. He gives you clothes. He gives you a car. He gives you a house. He gives you all these things that you got. That's how amazing my God is. You got what I'm saying now? That's, that's a good God. That's a good God. That's a good God. I'm going to tell you something. And I ain't doing this to, to toot my horn because I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve this vacation that I'm going on. I don't deserve it, but thank God he gave it to me. Thank God that he's given me a place to where my cell phone won't work. I'm just saying. Thank you, Lord. I don't deserve it, though. I don't deserve it. Do you walk around sometimes and just say, I don't deserve this? God, you're too good to me. I don't understand why you're so good to me. You ever just cry sometimes and say, God, why are you so good to me? Or do we just do just the opposite? God, I deserve more than this. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't deserve nothing you got. We just got a loving God that gave it to you. Isn't that awesome? Last time I checked, we got air conditioning in this building. You don't deserve it. But God gave it to us. You got comfortable seats you're sitting in. You don't deserve it. But God gave it to us. Wow. Entitlement. (laughs) Last thing. Discontentment. What would be the definition, the simple definition of discontentment? Not being content. <laughs> Not being content. That discontentment comes in our lives so many times because, hey, you know what? Let me just throw out a few things right off the top of my head that I could think of with discontentment. Right? Discontentment. I want more than what I've got. Greediness, right? Throws in there. Okay? So I'm greedy. I want more. I want more. I want more. And God says, you've got enough. Be content with what you got. I want more, though. I want more. You see? I want more. I want more. That's all we say all the time. You know what another one is? Boredom. We get bored. Oh, you know what? I'm bringing out the Bible on this one because y'all looking at me like I'm stupid. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to read anything about it. I'm just going to show you. 
You tell me that boredom, boredom don't affect your life? You tell me that I'm just going to be honest and real with you. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to be honest and real with you because I want you to know that you're not the only one that does this. So when I say this, don't you sit there and look at me like I'm a heathen. All right? I know I'm a heathen. I didn't told you that. Sometimes I get bored with reading the Bible. <gasps> that shock you? Let's just be real. You know what? The problem with people is they're not real anymore. You want to lie about it and say that the Bible don't get boring to you sometimes? If it don't, let me give you some scriptures to read. Let me give you a couple books to read. Go read through Leviticus and tell me you don't get bored. You read about all the Levitical laws and you, your head will be spinning and be like, oh, Lord, I'm tired of this one. Let me tell you something. Isn't that great to know that we're so real that we can say that sometimes I get bored reading the Bible? But let me tell you something. There's other times, though, when I'm reading this Bible and I, and I push through those boring times. You know what? The boring times, matter of fact, it's because of me right here. It's not because of God. It's not because His Word is boring. It's because of my heart problem. My heart condition sometimes makes the Word boring. You know why? Because I'm already wanting to think next to the next step. I want to do something else. I want to do something more productive than just sit there and read the Bible. Hey, it's human nature. You know what, though? When I push through those, through those times and I read that Word, all of a sudden there's a Scripture that comes to me. Wow, I needed that. God, thank you so much. You see, what happens is that we're not content a lot of times in our lives. So in other words, can I tell you this about the Bible? Sometimes it's going to get boring. Sometimes you're going to be like, what in the world did that just say? I tried to pronounce those names, couldn't pronounce one of them. Is this in another language? Sometimes you're going to feel like that. You know what you got to do? Push through it. Push through it. Know that God, this is God's word. And be content that he gave us his word. That he gave us his word. Leaning on a fence one day, a devout Quaker was watching a neighbor. It reminds me of that commercial, you know. What are the settlers? <laughs> you ever seen that one with direct TV and you got the settlers over there and they're watching just basic cable? And yeah, that's about where our world's become. But leaning on his fence one day, a devout Quaker was watching a new neighbor move in next door. After all kinds of modern appliances, electronic gadgets, plush furniture, and costly wall hangings had been carried in, the onlooker called over, If you find you're lacking anything, neighbor, let me know, and I'll show you how to live without it. Wow. Isn't that cool? He said, I'll show you how to live without it. You know what? There's probably something not far away from being the truth when you get into people like the Quakers and you get into the Midianites and you get into the Amish people. They probably ain't far from being the truth because they've learned to live with this stuff and say, I don't need all this stuff. Maybe sometimes we need to go back to those ways. I'm not saying that you're going to give up your stuff, but I'm saying that we don't need everything that we got and then keep pushing for more. Benjamin Franklin said, content makes poor men richer. Discontentment makes rich men poor. Isn't that cool? Now tell me this. When you read that scripture or look it up, and I'm going to read it to you again after I just preach this message. I want you to hear it again. Now listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. Now godliness with contentment is great what? Gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing with these shall be content. And those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. There's your trap. And is a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Wow. For the love, remember the green stuff is not evil itself. It's just paper. Right? For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from their faith and greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Where are you at today? Where are you at today? I mean, are you just in a place to where you say, you know what, I'm always wanting something more. I bet you if I was to ask this, I bet you some of you said that yesterday. Boy, would I love to have fill in the blank. If you hadn't said it yesterday, you probably said it in a week, within a month. Boy, how I would like to have this. 
Oh, how I would like to have that. Be content in what you have. When those of you that sit at my table of Japan tonight, be content with what you got. Because that's all you're getting. <laughs> Contentment's where it at. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We fill that hole in our heart with God. We're going to be content. Let's pray.